Hello, my name is Phyllis Moore. The name of my channel is Philosophically Speaking. And I welcome you today and invite you, if you have not already done this, to hit like, share, subscribe. There's also a bell that you can click on to notify you of upcoming videos as they come out. I am particularly excited because I am doing a series which I have not done but I just think it's uh, important because I make reference all the time to something that happened to me which was being diagnosed with breast cancer in 2014 as the at the time of this recording that makes me five years cancer free I'm very excited about that very humbled very grateful and um, and appreciative of uh, being in that status so uh, I don't know if you are going through it now or have or have known someone who did or or maybe in your family maybe a loved one but I really wanted to touch on this subject because October is breast cancer awareness month and um, since I know there are many 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 other kinds of cancer and certainly I can't say anything about those because that has not been my experience, but there probably are some similarities just based upon the fact that uh, when we get a diagnosis that is a shock to the system, you know, it just rocks our world. And sometimes, uh, regardless of the specifics and the details, sometimes just knowing you're not alone. Um, having an awareness that other people have gone through it and just realizing that other people care about you even if they're a stranger can be very gratifying and I hope that that will be the case for you here what I'm going to do in the upcoming days as this unfolds is try to be I guess as realistic as possible I'm not going to be clinical I'm not a doctor I'm not an expert I'm not going to be gloom and doom just because the underlying thread that was woven throughout my own journey was one of faith uh, Facebook and finding the funny and that's the that's the premise of the book that I published uh, probably in 2016 2017 which was called oh gosh I forgot the name of my book I'm sorry <laughs> squirrel something just went by I'm sorry feathers on my path I remember I do remember I'm, I'm not losing all those brain cells from my chemo um, it's just me but um, there really were some silver linings there were many silver linings and I hope to share some of those with you and I hope that this will just be a visit for us and nothing that will bring you down but will just link up to your heart because uh, when you're going through something that is unexpected I just don't think there's any way to prepare us for something like this even even if you suspect or think that's what's going to happen or you might uh, be in denial or, or trying to sweep it under the carpet or just be shell-shocked whatever the dynamic it is something that is um, not necessarily you know a preparation for us that that we are are braced for and ready and educated and and um, you know all all in line to receive that kind of information so today I'm just going to touch a little bit on the initial part you know maybe you have a history in your family maybe others that you've known but at this stage of the game I think most of us have been impacted and touched in some way shape or form maybe we've known someone directly or indirectly I remember years ago being in a church and one of uh, our pastors his little boy got some form of cancer and what a shock you know when it's a child that's particularly uh, poignant because we're not expecting that but but the way things are going now whether it's environmental or genetic or what have you uh, there's there's just so you know it's not a direct correlation saying up oh, you did something wrong it's not always because you know there was you know mitigating factors that that you know made that happen for you it might just be a predisposed predisposition I guess condition whatever I I had a history of it in my family my grandmother you know from golly 30 40 years before I was diagnosed she had had that so you know it might be in your in your genealogy it might be before you were even born so some of this we know some of this we don't know and some of it is like the black box that they always refer to on an airplane 
when a, when a plane goes down, there's always that black box they talk about that has all the information. That it's kind of like a, an autopsy of a plane, if you will. That when they check, they'll say, oh, this is what led up to it. This is what caused the plane crash, etc. And even if you find out and determine what the cause was and why it happened and what led up to it and what was preventable or not, the outcome remains the same. Whether there were casualties in the plane crash or not, you know, you can't change the outcome. All you can do is be more aware. So that's been my philosophy throughout everything that I've undergone. And that is that uh, the only thing that made me different from anybody else was that I had information. I had a diagnosis and that was like a wake up call, like an alarm that went off and said, whoa, okay, wake up. Don't sleepwalk through life. This gives you an opportunity to be aware and every day you navigate a little bit more wisely just because you appreciate every day. So nothing, and I mean nothing, because if you're a person of faith, you probably know this, and that is that even if someone tells you you have a diagnosis and you have a prognosis and you know, however they determine how long you have to live. I don't know. I didn't want to know. I wouldn't want to know. And in my case, that wasn't what happened. They didn't give me a, a time frame. So even if they do, doctors are human beings. And only God who created life and our life and the world and, and um, you know, he knows everything. So he's gone on ahead of us. He This did not come as any surprise to him when we get such news. And I often likened him to being, um, I'll, I'll just put the word picture out there for you, sitting up in his, his uh, recliner on a Sunday morning. And well, in my case, I wrote a column and it came out on Sunday morning. So I said, he wasn't sitting there on this particular Sunday opening up the paper and saying, oh my gosh, Phyllis has cancer. What do I do? I had plans for her. She was going to do this and that and the other and they, I had a to-do list and hmm, I guess I'll have to scrap that. That's not what happened. It did not come as a surprise to him. He knew and he had, you know, he was shining the flashlight, if you will, on my path. So I was very fortunate, but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know, okay, it's all going to turn out well or, or work out or whatever. And in that regard, that's much like every day of our lives. We don't know what's going to happen when we wake up in the morning. We don't know if we're going to be in an accident or if the day is going to go well or not well, or if we're still going to have our job or, you know, if we're going to trip and, and fall going out the front door. So you just have to get up and do the very best you can and, uh, and not beat yourself up or second guess. There will always be people who will say, oh, I'm afraid if I go out today, I'll get hit by a bus or have an accident or any number of things. But if we lived our life that way, we would never get out of bed. And that, I'm sorry to say, might be the very day that a big dump truck comes and runs into your house and, and you know, you happen to be in its path. So see, accidents can happen anywhere. It's not really helpful to blame ourselves or to see if we can find the reason why, you know, things happen to us or is it our fault. Blaming is not going to necessarily affect the outcome in a great way. And besides which, that's a lot of energy that we shouldn't use, time and energy that we don't have. So leading up to it, I'll just say that I had a history of breast cancer and, and other cancers in my family. So I was kind of in the back of my mind preparing not to have it because I don't think that's helpful to ever veer into it and think I'm going to get this one day. I just know I am. No, I just tried to be educated and get all the necessary checks along the way and, and have my physical and get the mammograms and all of that. Despite that, when it happened, and I will say not only did my grandmother have it, but my mother has had breast cancer twice, the exact same type and everything came back on the other side. So, I mean, there's all kinds of ways you could second guess or say, oh, should have done this, could have done this, would have done this, you know, whatever. Again, not productive. And so when it happened to me, for me, um, and it wasn't even in the, in the way I thought it would, you know, I'll get a mammogram, I'll get a special biopsy, whatever. No, that wasn't the way it happened. Literally, literally, I usually had my physical about January every year. And this particular year, I had had all kinds of fibroids and lumps and bumps and things. So just so you know, 
I had gotten to the point where it was like, gosh, I'm not even sure what I'm feeling for when you do those monthly routine exams. And so it was probably November of that year, and I called my OBGYN and just said, you know, should I get checked? I, I, you know, I sometimes think, you know, I don't want to ignore anything. I don't want to be oblivious to it. So we did the routine tests and all that as usual. It's November. He calls me and doctors don't always give you the results over the phone or certainly not in a voicemail. But in this case, he did probably because it was good news. And I'll never forget it was on, it was on the day before Thanksgiving. I remember that because the message he gave me essentially said, you know, I see a slight change. There's a little bit, you know, that you could probably be aware of and we will just keep an eye on it because right now it's November and I usually come in in, in January. So, you know, think we're good. Happy Thanksgiving. So I went on to have a really good holiday. And between Thanksgiving and Christmas, my left side swelled up. It was just like, what is going on? So it wasn't like I would have predicted or thought or expected, but it felt like a croquet ball was, was in my chest. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's, it's a hard wooden ball that you play croquet with and it was just very painful my clothes started fitting differently and I just I looked lopsided and and it hurt it was very painful but it wasn't like I felt a lump it just felt like something was just massive in there and I think I just panicked and froze and and just I didn't know what to do so I just ignored it and you know that was just me and by Christmas time I thought oh, this isn't going away and so I called my doctor and said, this is what's going on, explained over the phone. He did not even ask to see me. He immediately called a specialist in a city that was like an hour away and set up an appointment for me. So again, I didn't choose to panic and worry. I just thought nothing I can do until I go to see him. So that ended up having happening in January and I went in and I had seen this doctor before, so it was not a, a huge thing. I was comfortable with him. In fact, when I had seen him before, it was for over a series of months, and he reached the point where he said, you know, there's nothing else I can do for you. You're good. Every, all the tests are clear. And I liked him. I did. I liked him a lot. And yet... Um, I remember saying to him, you know, I don't need to come back to you. You know, I, I like you, but you know, if I don't have to see you again, that would be great. Well, I ended up, I did have to see him again because now here I find myself in his office and he checked it out, did a biopsy, long story short, made an appointment and I returned on January 21st, 2014. And I mean, I was probably nervous, but I still was like sleepwalking because I just couldn't, wouldn't, didn't want to prepare for that kind of news. And so when I went in that day, I, you know, my husband was with me. I think it's always good on the off chance, um, not that you take someone with you for every appointment that you ever go to, but definitely in this case, I was very glad I had, because I don't know that I would have wanted or been very good at driving myself home. But in any event, we went in and we're waiting and waiting. And this young girl came in and I, I in, a, in my book I called her like a candy striper because she looked awfully young to me and she came in and she laid out all these papers on the uh, I guess the, the table and I wasn't expecting this because I didn't know who she was. Nurses come in you know prior to the doctor all the time so that wasn't you know foreign to me but I just wasn't expecting this to be the way the news was delivered to me. And she came in and, as I say, spread out all these papers and starts ch 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 chatting. And, and then I heard, you know, I was kind of like not making sense of what she was saying because she was talking about cancer and this and that. And I thought, what? You know, I, I just did not envision that this young girl I had never seen before would come in and talk to me and tell me the news. So she kind of gathered all her papers and left. And she probably wondered, you know, why didn't you ask any questions? Or It just felt fell through. And the doctor comes in and I don't know if this is the way they normally do it. I just think there's a better way to do it. And hopefully you've had better news or news delivered better to you because he came in and started scurrying all around. And I guess he thought I knew what was going on, but he gave me three words, chemo, mastectomy, radiation. And of course I'm like, 
I don't like any of those words. What do they mean? And I really, really, really didn't like the middle one there because I thought, really, you're telling me I have to have all of those done? And as a reporter, I had met and interviewed and done stories on women who had um, electively had a mastectomy because they didn't want to get... Um, have it be worse if it became cancer. And this was around the era when Angelina Jolie had opted to have a mastectomy because she had a predisposition in her genetics with her mom. And so it was, I, don't, I won't say common, I won't say popular, but it was not unheard of to electively go that route. I was not in that camp though. This was not that day. And even when I got the news, I still was reticent. It was like, what? But he gave me the news and told me this is this is what we're going to do. First, we'll have the, the chemo, then we'll have the mastectomy, and then we'll have radiation. That's the way it's going to work for you. And I just, even though I'm a reporter, I did not sit there and go, oh, okay, well, I have these questions. Didn't happen. I just was like, what? Okay. Then he left. And, and, I have to say, I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know what emotions to have. I just didn't even know. And I, and my poor husband, I think of that every now and then and go, oh my gosh, this poor guy had to be strong for both of us. So he couldn't blink. He couldn't look like, you know, anything. And so the doctor left. He said, that, well, on his way out, the nurse will have some information for you. And I, my go-to, if you ever watch Friends and you, and you know that, the character of Chandler who would say, my defense mechanism is humor. Yeah, that's me. So as soon as the doctor exited and I sat there, I didn't go to humor right away. My first comment was, we need to pray. And we did. And and luckily Ron did that for me because I I couldn't even tell you what, you know, what I was thinking or feeling at that point, but we did pray. And I, I know that was the way to go. And that was the recourse to just ask for God to help us through this. And then maybe to break the tension, I said, I said, you think I'm going to get a tote bag? I don't know why in the world I would have said that because I had plenty of tote bags. I didn't need a tote bag. It's not like we're on, let's make a deal and I'm going to get a parting gift for being on this game show, whatever. But we kind of pulled it together and went out into the area by the nurse's station. And as we're sitting there, she, I guess, was making appointments for us and, and putting together the materials. And she, I guess, uh, walked around the nurse's station and I noticed in her hand a very large, bright, pink tote bag. And so I said, ah, I told you I'd get a tote bag. I'm sure this woman who has probably worked there and seen other uh, people that had been diagnosed with cancer and probably thought, this woman is very strange. But I was just trying to lighten the, mo m the mood, the moment, and uh, take my little pink tote bag. So we, you know, picked ourselves up and started to walk out. And as I am proudly walking through this office and we go through the waiting room, suddenly it, uh, it dawned on me, oh my gosh, I'm holding this very large, very bright pink tote bag. And if anybody is in this waiting area and they have ever been diagnosed with something in this office, they probably know the significance of this bag. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna be carrying this around too much because I don't wanna draw attention to it. But in that moment, I just kind of walked on out and we got outside and I remember it being a beautiful day. It, it was North Carolina and even though it was in January, it was a very sunny day. And I remember getting outside and I turned to my husband and I grabbed him by the collar and just looked him in the eye and said, we are going to laugh every single day. Now, I wasn't borrowing trouble. I wasn't worrying. I was still thawing out maybe. But I remember thinking, we have got to find a way to laugh. We've got to find things to laugh at. We cannot be buried under this. We cannot succumb to this uh, because, you know, you need to, to unite forces. We needed to have faith and we needed to have a sense of humor. Now, I know that's not for everybody and it's not the natural response and it's not, you know, the only response, but I really wanted to... I guess, again, thaw out from this and come out on the other side and trust that 
people were going to be put into place to help us. And that proved to be the case because before we even got out of the city limits, I started getting calls. You know, there's going to be, you know, this test set up for you tomorrow and you'll meet with the oncologist tomorrow and the next day you'll do that. So it was all kind of taken care of. So my feeling on that is as difficult as getting a diagnosis can be and is, if in today's, I guess, healthcare culture, if people are responding to this, you know, and, and making sure you have, you know, immediate care, that they're not putting you off and saying, well, we'll see you in six months, that they are calling you and saying, put one foot in front of the other. Your, your appointment is here. You need to go there. You need to do this. That's what you want because you don't want people to dawdle and say, yeah, we'll get to you when we get to you. So, you know, find the silver linings. That's the first rule of thumb. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. I had people that would, would tell me later that, they'd read things that I had written in my column and, and say, oh, I wasn't ready for that. And so I am mindful of that. I am mindful that, you know, if you have just been diagnosed and you are just finding this out, you may not want to hear or read or see or know anything right now because it, it can be a fear factor that you can sit there and go, oh, I'm afraid. It's kind of like a movie that you're not sure. You almost want to send someone else in and say, would you watch it first to make sure I can handle this? And understood, totally understood. My prayer and my hope is that somewhere down the road at the appropriate time, there will be things that I share in this series that encourage you or support you, whether it's something that you need to hear or see or feel or think um, that would, that it will be, the seeds will be planted where they need to go. And if it's not for you, maybe it will help you to be more sensitive or compassionate or supportive of someone who is going through it because you'll, you'll get a, 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 you know, an idea that it's not what you say, you know, I mean, sometimes the less said, the better. Sometimes it's just you being there for someone else or they being there for you and, and just in the very basic, most primitive things, just take care of those needs of sleeping and eating and just sitting next to somebody who needs you to be there. Nobody, you know, in my, in my experience, I didn't need people to have all the answers for me. I just needed to know that I wasn't going to be walking this path in the dark by myself. The other thing I will say for today is at the very simple, simple, basic start of such a journey, don't get on the internet and don't read everything that you can. You think that's going to be helpful and it's like, oh good, there's plenty of information. Yeah, but, you know, I learned early on a little of that goes a long way. We don't need to read everything. We don't need to know everything. And you certainly don't want to be a hypochondriac like I can be and, and, and all of us can be because we could sit there and go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. No, no. As you'll see in the next, in the next segment, I'm going to talk to you about my oncologist. She was awesome. And she set the tone as I would hope that that you find yourself that setting the tone even if you have to take those reins and do it for yourself but I'm going to share a little bit about how beneficial that was when I had someone who really wanted to minimize the damage and kind of approach the the attitude of of just re being reassured and just like I say, putting one foot in front of the other and taking it moment by moment, day by day, and not biting off more than, than you can chew at this point. Um, I, I am hoping that you'll stay tuned and follow through this journey and that in some way it will help ease your pain and your path and just help you to maintain hope. Hope is a powerful thing. Choose happy as much as you can. Try to find silver linings. Try to find things to be joyful about and try not to worry because, uh, you know, not that there isn't anything to worry about, but it doesn't serve you. It's not good energy. It takes time and it pulls you away from using that energy and reserving it for other things that you need to just kind of stay afloat. So try to enjoy your day. I'll be back again tomorrow with another segment. Bye-bye.